ان الحمد لله نحمد تعالى ونستعين ونستغفر ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهدي الله فهو محدد ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارham ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا واتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما ما بعد من الاستك الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر امور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدع وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله واهلها في النار اما بعد So beginning the topic the topic is uh the benefits of knowledge or the benefits of seeking knowledge and by knowledge we mean islamic knowledge we mean what as a prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam referred to it in hadith or a hadith uh in many hadith he said uh al ilm nafi'a you know the beneficial knowledge and although we can gain many different types of knowledge like for example the knowledge of uh you know by going to college to be an engineer or to be a doctor or what have you that is a beneficial worldly knowledge but whenever we hear al nafia mentioned by the scholars and in the books um the early the classical scholars books and according to the hadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam then it is referring to al nafia meaning beneficial knowledge meaning knowledge of the sharia you know islamic knowledge and so from a large portion of this lecture i actually just wanted to go through uh imam nawawi's book in riyadh salihin in the book of the chapter of knowledge kitab al ilm because to um to traverse the path of the scholars from before is the best way to uh gain knowledge it is the best way to gain knowledge and so the way they transmitted the knowledge is the best way for us to attain the knowledge for anyone who wants to seek uh beneficial knowledge meaning knowledge of the sharia and seeking knowledge is an act of worship seeking knowledge is an act of ibadah and as we know the two conditions for any type of uh worship any time we want to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the two conditions that must be in place is first and foremost ikhlas you know that we have sincerity to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that the worship is solely to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the second condition for all of our acts of worship is that it is in accordance with the sunna of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wa ala alihi wasallam and that includes seeking the knowledge because if seeking the knowledge is a type of ibadah or a type of worship then it only uh leads us to the same conclusion that it requires those conditions which is ikhlas and the sunna and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran regarding ikhlas in in many many uh verses but the scholars usually begin with this ayat in surah al-bayna wa ma umiru illa li'abudu Allah mukhlisin lahu dinahu hunafa wa yuqimu salat wa yutu zakah wa dhalika dinu al-qayyimah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran about the the children of Israel in in the the communities that came before us before the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam that they were only commanded 
to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and not associate partners with him. And this is the meaning of ikhlas, that this is the, the meaning of sincerity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that we direct all of our worship and our intention behind everything we do to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that we do it we do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we direct it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and as I'm sure we're all aware and which is very uh, beneficial to mention this hadith is a hadith of uh, Umar bin al-Khattab radiyallahu ta'ala an the hadith where Umar ibn al uh, Ibn Abu uh, Umar Ibn Al Khattab radiyallahu an he said uh, he said the Prophet he said he heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say سَمِعْتُ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ يَقُولُ إِنَّمَا أَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ مَرِيَّةٍ مَنَوَى فَمَنْ كَانَ الْحِجْتُ إلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ فَحِجْتُ إلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَمَنْ كَانَ الْحِجْتُ لِلْدُّنْيَا يُسِيبُهَا أَوْ إِمْرَأَةٍ يَنْكِحُهَا يَنْكِحُهَا فَحِجْتُ إلَى مَا هَجَرَ إلَيْهِ and in this hadith Umar bin al Khattab رضي الله عنه who was the second Khalifa after Abu Bakr رضي الله عنهم أجمعين he said I heard the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم say that verily actions are tied to the intentions and everyone will get that for which he intended therefore he who migrates for Allah and his messenger then he is migrated for Allah and his messenger and he who migrates to take some world uh, to take some woman in marriage or to gain some worldly benefit then he is migrated then he will get that for which he migrated and this shows us the importance of our intention and that intention is a part of our worship and a condition for our worship that we have to have the proper intention for whatever we do regardless of whether it's going out and seeking the knowledge or whether it is even in our homes uh, reading the Quran or any type of worship in any type of uh, seeking of the knowledge that we have to do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we have to do it to please Allah and then we will receive the benefits of trying to attain that knowledge and the reward in this life as well as the hereafter and the Salaf meaning the pious predecessors starting with the Sahaba and the Tabi'een with Taba'a Tabi'een there was a, a, a very famous statement that is mentioned uh, about the Salaf that they used to say Talib al-ilm, Talib al-jannah that the person who seeks the knowledge is the one who is seeking paradise so Talib al-ilm is Talib al-jannah you know when, you're, when you are seeking knowledge you're reading beneficial books to, lo to learn more about uh, to correct your, your beliefs your beliefs to uh, learn how to practice something or a fiqh issue or you're reading the Quran all of this are means they are a wasila for you to uh, get to Jannah because they are acts of worship and so that's a good reminder for myself and for the listeners ta'ala, is that to make sure your intention is pure in whatever you uh, whatever act of worship that you're doing and especially or this also includes seeking the knowledge because often we don't you know refer or or reflect and and think that seeking knowledge is an act of ibadah but in fact it is and if a person makes their intention for example to sit in a halak uh, a halaka you know um, a, a gathering where they're reading the Quran or if someone is giving a small lecture after the salat and you sit and sit in that lecture there will be uh, forgiveness for you as the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that you'll receive forgiveness and you'll see, receive the uh, mercy you know from the angels and you will be mentioned with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for sitting in those gatherings 
where they are remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is why it's incredibly important that we always reflect and remember that seeking the knowledge is worship. Another very, very important hadith, which also lets us, uh, it gives us something to reflect on and makes clear for us that seeking the knowledge is an act of worship and one of the highest acts of worship. It is also known, a lot of the, uh, many of the scholars, they mention that seeking the knowledge is a type of jihad. It's a type of striving in the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so uh, it is imperative that we always reflect on that. And in the hadith of, uh, mentioned by Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, an Abi Huraira radiallahu anhu qal, سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول إن الأول الناس يقضى يوم القيامة عليه رجل أستشهد فأتي بي فعرفه نعمه فعرفها قال فما عملت فيها قال قتلت فيك حتى أستشهد قال كذبت ولكنك قتلت لأن يقال جريء فقد كيل ثم أمر به فصحب لوجهه this is the, the first part of the hadith that was narrated by Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu who said he heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say that the first people on the day of judgment, the first three people or from amongst the first people that will be judged on the day of judgment, the first one being a man who was martyred and he will be brought before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his deeds will be made known and he will know and understand uh, what's being said to him and I'll, he will be asked so what did you do you know what what did you do in this life basically what did you do for my sake he'll he'll answer by saying I fought for your sake until I was martyred and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will respond to him and say, you lied. However, or, or rather, you did this so that the people would praise you and say that you were brave. And they said you were brave. And then this man will be dragged into the hellfire on his face. And then the second man, وَرَجُلٌ تَعَلَّمَ الْعِلْمُ وَعَلَّمَهُ وَقَرَى الْقُرْآنِ فَأُتِيَ بِي فَعَرَّفُهُ نِعَمُهُ فَعَرَفَهَا قال فما عملت فيها قال تعلمت العلم وعلمته وقرات فيك القران وقرات فيك القران قال كذبت ولكنك تعلمت العلم ليقال عالم وقرات القران ليقال هو قاري قارئ فقد كيل ثم امر به فصحب على وجهه حتى الكف النار so this is the second individual that will be amongst the people uh, brought before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment. And this is the man who uh, will be asked, so what did you do for my sake? Or what did you do? And the man will respond by saying that, you know, I was a knowledgeable person. You know, I was an alim. Okay? Uh, also, and that I also read the Quran. You know, that he was a, a beautiful reciter of the Quran. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say to this individual that you have lied. You know, you have lied. You've not done this for my sake. And you, you, you sought the knowledge so that the people would praise you and call you an alam. And you read the Quran so they would say you were a beautiful reciter of the Quran. And it was said about you. So then this person will receive their benefit and their reward in this life, meaning the praise of the people. However, in the hereafter, they will be of the khasirin. They will be of those people who are the losers. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, will call them a liar and drag them in the, hell, in the hellfire by their face. And then the third person that was mentioned in the hadith, as, as it's a very long hadith, was the man who spent and... It was said the people believed that he spent in the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, he, he did sadaqah. He did all kind of different types of charity. 
He built Masajid. He did these things. However, his intention was not pure. The point being here is it shows us that seeking the knowledge is one of the highest deeds that you can do in Islam if you do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if you do it for the worldly gain or to gain praise of the people, then it can actually work against you to the degree that you end up in the hellfire and that it also becomes an act of shirk. And depending on your, uh, your uh, level of doing these, these types of ibadah, it could be the major shirk or the minor shirk, and of course the major shirk will take you out of the fold of Islam. No one wants to, be, to die upon that. And the minor shirk will uh, negate the deeds that you did the shirk in. So the major shirk, of course, will erase all of your deeds. If you die upon disbelief, you die upon shirk al-akbar. But if you die, or when you do the minor shirk, like showing off a riyah and doing things to be heard, uh, to have your name mentioned or to gain fame, then these nullify the deed in which you were trying to show off for. So, for example, the person who goes and seeks knowledge, maybe they travel to Egypt, and they want to learn the Arabic language, and they want to learn something of the Qur'an, and they want the people to praise them because they went and traveled on the path of knowledge. Then this person, depending on the level of their uh, their wanting to be praised and, and so forth, if it, it constitutes the minor shirk, then it will just negate the fact that they were seeking the not trying to seek the knowledge. You know, the act of traveling to seek the knowledge, the reward they could have got for actually traveling and seeking the knowledge. It will negate that action if it's the minor shirk. If it's the major shirk, it will negate everything they did previously if they die upon that. So again, this shows us the importance that knowledge is an act of worship or seeking knowledge, beneficial knowledge, meaning knowledge of Islam is the knowledge that will bring us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and is one of the closest ways that we can come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam Nawawi mentions, he begins his chapter, he mentions several ayats. He says, قال إمام نووي رحمه الله تعالى قال الله تعالى وقول ربي زدني علما. So Imam Nawawi begins with a verse from the Quran where Allah the Almighty says, "And say, my Lord, uh, my Lord, increase me in knowledge." Okay, so this was a du'a that even uh, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam made, and and for us to always ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all of our affairs and of course that includes seeking the knowledge that we should ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to increase us in beneficial knowledge. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all with al nafi ruskan tayyiba wa amnan mutaqabilin. Ameen. And the second ayat, وَقَالَ تَعَالَى كُلْ هَلْ يَسْتُوِيَ الَّذِينَ يَعْمَلُونَ وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَعْمَلُونَ and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Zumr that say is or, or are the people that practice or you know do righteous deeds similar to the ones who do, who do not do righteous deeds? And of course this includes uh, knowledge and this is why Imam Nawawi mentioned it uh, amongst these verses in his uh, Kitab Al-Ilm. وَقَالَ تَعَالَى Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that Allah raises those people who believe from you and those who He has given, uh, given knowledge and He raises them you know, at different degrees. So again, this shows us the importance of knowledge and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will raise you by your knowledge. When you're seeking the knowledge for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you're inviting people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's path, to his deen, to his religion. 
then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will raise you. Allah will, will raise your, your level as a believer. You, these are ways in which you come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَقَالَ تَعَالَى إِنَّمَا يَخْشَى اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاء And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that verily those people who fear Allah the most from His slaves are the ulama, are the scholars. So it shows us that again, that knowledge is a wasila. Knowledge is a means to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a means. It's a type of doing righteous deeds. And it is a means to, be, uh, to draw nearer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to be of those who fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah uh, says it with, with, with certainty there. That innama yakhsha Allah min ibadi ulama. That verily those who fear Allah the most are the scholars. So the more knowledge you gain, the more beneficial knowledge you gain, meaning knowledge of the Sharia, and that you're practicing that knowledge, you're understanding and practicing that knowledge, then this will. Uh, increase your taqwa. This will incre your, increase your khashia, your fearfulness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your heart will be uh, become softer and more mercy and you will, you will exhibit more God fearfulness in your actions. This is, these are the thamarat al-ilm. These are the benefits or the fruits of seeking knowledge. Is that it should have some uh, effect upon your actions and on your manners. Then Imam Nawawi, rahimahullah ta'ala, he mentioned the hadith of Mu'awiyah radiyallahu anhu. Wa an Mu'awiyah radiyallahu anhu qal, qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, man yuridallahu bihi khayran yufaqahu fiddeen. That the Prophet ﷺ said, whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants good for his servant, he gives him knowledge of the religion. He gives him fiqh. He gives him ma'rafah. You know, he gives him uh, knowledge of the, the ahkam or the, the, ruling, the rulings related to the religion. And he's able to teach the religion. He gives him understanding of the religion. So this is a sign that Allah wants good for a person when Allah increases his or her knowledge related to the religion. And the, the scholars, they often mention with this, they say, وَمَفْهُمْ فِي هَذَا hadith, يعني the, the, What's understood from this hadith is that the one who is not given an increase in knowledge is, is uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't want khair for them. Meaning if someone stays in their same position, they're never advancing in their knowledge of the religion. They stay the same. And they're not doing anything to increase their, their worship. Because of course, we need knowledge in order to practice. You know, as Imam, uh, as Imam uh, al-Bukhari, rahimahullah ta'ala mentioned in his, uh, in Sahih al-Bukhari, the chapter, al-ilm qabla al-qawli wal-amal, that he said, knowledge precedes uh, actions and statements. So this shows us the importance of having knowledge because we need that in order to have fiqh fi deen, in order to have the wisdom and the understanding of the religion, you have to have knowledge. Okay? And a sign that Allah wants good for you is if you are increasing in your knowledge. So that, that's imperative for us to strive our best to increase uh, ourselves through beneficial knowledge. And another benefit from this uh, hadith is that this hadith shows us the importance or the, the benefit of attaining knowledge in general and that it, is, it includes every type of, uh, of khair, every type of goodness is, in, is contained in seeking knowledge and that it requires tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that it requires 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you that understanding. Because there are many people who try to uh, seek knowledge, but then they are not given tawfiq for whatever reason. Maybe, possibly, it could be their sins, and it could be their intention was not correctly. And at the end of the lecture, we're going to talk about some of the obstacles to gaining knowledge. But there are those people, they go out and they gain very little bit, very, very little real knowledge. You know, there's no real um, fruits of their seeking knowledge as far as how they understand the religion and as far as how they practice. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us with, with uh, beneficial knowledge and bless us to practice it in a manner that pleases Him. I mean. And so, uh, in another hadith that Imam Anawawi rahimahullah ta'ala mentioned, وعن, uh, وعن وعن ابن مسعود رضي الله عنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم لا حاسد إلا في اثنتين رجل أتاه الله مالا فصلته على هلكته في الحق ورجل أتاه الله الحكمة فهو يقضي بها ويعلمها متفق عليه in this hadith that was mentioned by Ibn, uh, Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, who said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said that there is no envy except in two things. Or je there's no jealousy except in two matters. A man who was given, uh, who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given wealth and he used it to protect himself, uh, you know, to, to, to help the, the truth and, you know, to protect himself from being destroyed, meaning from the hellfire and doing uh, the haram. So he used, spends it in righteousness. And the second person is the person who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives wisdom. And then he uh, teaches that wisdom. So he's given knowledge, he or she is given knowledge, and then they disseminate that knowledge by teaching people and by exhibiting that knowledge on their, uh, through their actions, of course. So that's incredibly important for us to, to always uh, reflect on those ahadith of the Prophet wasallam, which encourage us to seek knowledge and the benefits of knowledge. And from this specific hadith, we learn it shows us you know, the times when it's permissible to have a type of jealousy, that it's not a negative jealousy, it's not hasid, it's not uh, hasid, which is, has a, a negative connotation, meaning that you have, you want to take the ni'mah of someone else from them. For example, if someone gains something from the dunya, maybe they have a new car, maybe uh, a brother, he gets married to a very beautiful woman, or uh, vice versa, or uh, a person gains something of this dunya, and then someone else wants to see that benefit that they gain destroyed or taken from them. This is the, this is hasid. This is the envy which is impermissible in Islam. But the permissible type of jealous jealousy, meaning that you would like to attain it as well, and not that you want to take away their benefit. And the Prophet ﷺ mentioned it was in those two things. It was in the, the person who, has, uh, who Allah has favored with wealth, and then they spend it uh, in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's okay to, to want to be like that person and to have wealth like them. Because you're not asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to remove their, their benefit, but rather you are asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be like them to attain wealth like them and to spend it in khair like them, to gain the ajr. And this is the same with the person who is given knowledge and that uh, it, it's permissible in that sense to want to have knowledge like uh, another individual. For example, if you, you know, are aware of certain scholars or students of knowledge or what have you and you have a desire in your heart to be like them, 
and to have knowledge, you, you, you ask a lot, oh, I wish I had knowledge like so-and-so, like Sheikh uh, so-and-so. There's no harm in this, in this type of jealousy. And of course, you're not asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to remove their ni'mah that Allah has favored, with, favored them with. And this hadith shows us and encourages us to go on the path of knowledge, to seek knowledge. And it also shows us that it is an obligation to practice the knowledge and to teach people and do those things which are going to be beneficial to yourself, your family, and your community. And that is, of course, by teaching the knowledge and setting an example for others. Because how many people have we seen who gained something of knowledge. Maybe they memorized a lot of text. They memorized a lot of Quran. Maybe they memorized the whole Quran. They memorized uh, many hadith and maybe other books. But however, as far as their practice, you see a lot of weakness, meaning that they, they have the worst manners. This can be the case. So that, that is dalil, or that is evidence that that person did not benefit from that knowledge. They did not gain the true benefit. We're not saying all their benefit is gone because it depends on to what level the person is, he or she is practicing. But we have people who do go out and they memorize and they gain some benefit, but however, they, as far as their practice, it hasn't made any effect upon their practice. And that's what we want to be protected from. And so this hadith also uh, encourages us to seek the knowledge and to practice it. And that it is also permissible to want to gain, uh, gain knowledge like those people who have uh, went out and sought knowledge. And in another hadith, the hadith of Abi Musa, radiallahu anhu, who said that The Prophet sallallahu said, The example of guidance and knowledge with which Allah has sent me is like abundant rain falling on the earth, some of which was fertile soil that absorbed rainwater and brought forth vegetation and grass in abundance. And another portion of it was hard and held the rainwater, and Allah benefited the people with it, and they utilized it for drinking. And a portion of it was barren, which could neither hold the water nor bring forth vegetation. The first is the example of the person who comprehends Allah's religion and gets benefit from the knowledge which Allah Ta'ala has revealed through me, meaning the Prophet Sallallahu and learns and then teaches it to others. The last example is that of a person who does not care for it and does not take Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala's guidance revealed through me and he is like the barren land. So that shows us again the importance of the knowledge and practicing it. And striving to convey that knowledge for those who are able to do so. And that the person who uh, gains knowledge and practice it, practices it and teaches it is like the, person, is like the fertile soil. Because from fertile soil, you have thamarat, you have uh, fruit, and you have trees, and you have grass, and you have benefit. People benefit from, from that. Their crops grow. Animals can feed on that. So there's a lot of, uh, of benefit and gain. But the barren land, which is the example of the person who does not practice the, the knowledge, or the person who's careless and doesn't care about uh, knowledge, then they, they have very little, if any, benefit for themselves or the community. No one can benefit from them. And so this is incredibly important that also it shows us the benefit of knowledge as well and that of teaching it. And that the teaching, when we teach knowledge, it benefits the general people. It should benefit people in general, your community in general. Okay? And that... The scholars, they mention three uh, people who gain knowledge 
from this hadith. They said, the first person, or, or from amongst them, is the one who memorizes knowledge, and then they practice it, and they teach it to other than themselves. I mean, they teach it to other people. And they benefit themselves, and they benefit uh, others. This is the person who is in the best of uh, the best of examples or the best of conditions. And then there's the person who memorizes knowledge, and they also uh, share it with others, what they benefit from. And, however, they were maybe weak in their practice. So this person, obviously, their level is less, they're on a, a, a lesser, uh, a lower level than the, the other person. Because, again, what's meant by seeking knowledge and beneficial knowledge or the purpose is that we want to benefit in our practice of Islam. We want to understand Islam better and we want to practice it and then preach it. As uh, Sheikh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab rahimahullah ta'ala mentions in his book uh, Al-Rasul Thalatha, he says, I'lamu rahimahullah innahu yajibu alayna ta'alam arba masayib. He said it's, it, it's an obligation upon us to know four things. Al-Ula al-ilm. He said the first thing is knowledge. And then he mentions that knowledge is knowing Allah and knowing His Prophet and knowing uh, Islam with the textual pr proofs. And he says, Afani al amalu bi. Then he said the second thing is practicing it. Athalath al dawah tu ilay. Then he said the third thing is, is calling to that knowledge. Arabiya sabr ala adafi. And then he said the fourth thing is that a person should be patient when calling to knowledge. So again, we want to gain knowledge not to be praised by the people, but rather we want to gain knowledge so that way we can benefit ourselves and our community. And there's nothing wrong with having that intention when a person wants to go and study or if they study because now with the, with the internet and telephone and so forth, there's so many different ways to seek knowledge now that when a person has this intention that they want to benefit others, that doesn't uh, constitute shirk and that doesn't take any reward from the, uh, away from them, but rather that w will possibly increase their reward in the fact that they want to benefit themselves and other than them. They want to benefit their family. They want to benefit their community and help others practice uh, Islam better. So it's incredibly important for us to strive to... Uh, to, to, to seek beneficial knowledge and practice it and, and share it with others. And the third person that they, they mention was the one who, uh, who does, not, uh, does not even make any effort to gain knowledge. That they, they stay in the same state, they never listen to a lecture, they never open a book to read, they never try to do anything beneficial to increase themselves in khair and this individual will is is the worst of those those people and in fact depending on the level of disregard for the religion if someone doesn't even want to know the wajib they don't even know want to know their obligations they just sit and say no it's enough i'm muslim that's enough you know then this person is in a very very bad state of affairs and this is the one who the scholars were mentioning, Aswa and Nas, that they were the, the worst of people because the person who doesn't want to uh, benefit themselves by seeking the knowledge to learn their wajib, their oblig obligatory duties, then this person is, uh, you know, a, a, a loser in that sense in which because they don't want to benefit themselves and they will stay in a very ignorant state making sins because they, don't, they won't be able to tell, discern the truth from the falsehood. وَعَنْ سَحَلِ بِنْ سَعَدْ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ عَنَ النَّبِيَّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمَ قَالْ لِعَلِيَّ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْ فَوَاللَّهِ لِيَنْ يَهْدِيَ اللَّهُ بِكَ الرَّجَلٍ وَاحِدٍ خَيْرًا لَقِمٍ حُمْرَ النَّعْمِ مُتَفَقٌ عَلَيْهِ in this hadith that was uh, narrated by Sahal ibn Sa'ad radiallahu anhu about, from, the, uh, 
from the Prophet وسلم, that he said to Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an, he said, by Allah, or you know, the Prophet وسلم, swore by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by Allah, that if even one person is guided by your hand, then this is better for you than the red camels. And this was collected in Bukhari and Muslim. In this hadith, this also shows us again the importance of not just knowledge, but what? Of tabligh, meaning to share that knowledge. That it's important for us to share what we benefit. If we've benefited something of knowledge, then it's important to share that. And that as a person who seeks knowledge, that you should not restrict yourself to a certain group of people or individuals, but that rather you should share your knowledge with anyone who wants to uh, gain benefit, regardless of whether they're Muslim or non-Muslim, regardless of whether they are uh, from Ahlul Sunnah or other than Ahlul Sunnah, that you should want for their guidance. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, For Allah, لِيَنْ يَهْدِيَ اللَّهُ بِكَ الرَّجْلٍ وَاحِدٍ He said, and by Allah, that even if one man, or even if one person was guided by your hand, this is better for you than the red camels. SubhanAllah. And the red camels were something that was very prized uh, by the, the, the Arabs. You know, it was, it was known as one of the greatest types of wealth in the time of the Prophet ﷺ. The camels, but especially the red ones. So the Prophet ﷺ gave that example that this is one of the best things you could be doing, is that sharing the knowledge with, with other people. You know, by, by gaining the knowledge, of course, gaining correct knowledge, practicing it, and sharing it with others. Do not discriminate. If someone wants to know something about Islam, never turn away from them. Never turn away from them. You know, always uh, to, because you never know what someone is, is waiting to hear. You never know who's going to be guided. And I asked a question to one of our mashayikh, Shaykh Ibrahim al-Rahili, hafadhallahu ta'ala once. I asked him, I said, Shaykh, can we go and give uh, lectures or, uh, you know, to the people of innovation, the people who, have, who are changing the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? They are distorting the message of, of, you know, distorting the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They are, you know, have their own desires in how they understand the religion. Can we go to these people and, uh, uh, you know, do a lecture in their masjid or, you know, or what have you, you know, give them a lecture. And the shaykh answered, he said, he gave me this hadith. He said, he said, the Prophet ﷺ said, So if even one person is, gains benefit, then this is better for you than the red camels. Just maybe that person was waiting for those, those kind words that you said and that, those good manners that you exhibited. And that beneficial knowledge and it changed something in them you, you we never know how a reminder is going to benefit the believer nor how a reminder will even benefit uh disbelievers those people who don't believe in allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you never know how a person is going to be guided so we should never discriminate in when we want to articulate the message of islam that rather we should share that knowledge and be humbled by the knowledge and approach it in a humble position by sharing it with any and everyone who wants to benefit. And one of the benefits from this hadith, as we, we, we previously mentioned, is it shows us the importance of da'wah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it also encourages us to have a concern and a love, in fact, for the guidance of the creation. That we should want guidance for other people. We should never be rejoicing that someone is being misguided. If you see one of your brothers or sisters making mistakes, they're in sin. You should never be rejoicing saying, huh, so-and-so, you know, they did a mistake again. Or so-and-so, they, they committed that sin again. And, you know, yeah, let's just talk about it. Let's talk about them and, 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 and disgrace them. No, but rather 
you should be wanting for their guidance. And that is a condition uh, of the da'i, of the person who is calling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They must possess that characteristic that they actually want guidance for the people they're calling uh, to the truth. Because how can you possibly call someone without that sincerity, uh, the sincere want uh, for them to be guided? And in another hadith, this is a hadith of Abi Huraira radiallahu anhu, and Abi Huraira radiallahu anhu, and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam aqal, man sallaka tariqan yal talmisuhu bihi ilman, sahalallahu luhu bihi tariqan ila al-jannah, ruahu muslim wa ahmed. This hadith is very, very beautiful and very important. In this hadith, uh, that was narrated by Abu Huraira radiallahu an. He said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that whenever or, or, or that whoever traverses the path of knowledge, so whenever a person goes out to seek the knowledge, meaning beneficial knowledge, we're not talking about someone going off to college to be an engineer. This has benefit in the worldly benefit and you can also benefit the community, but this is not the knowledge that is meant here. So whenever a person is striving to gain that Islamic knowledge, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make easy for him the path to Jannah. So again, as we mentioned earlier when we said that a statement that the Salaf used to say that Talib al aun Talib al-Jannah, that the, the person who seeks knowledge is the, the seeker of the paradise. And this is affirmed in the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu that we just mentioned. Because that shows us that one of the paths to paradise, and what, what other path is there after that? You know, what else is greater than that? Is that seeking knowledge. Is seeking knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's deen by striving to attain it. This hadith shows us the benefit of seeking knowledge, of being a, a seeker of knowledge, and that it's a path to getting to paradise. Because what it does is it allows for the Muslim to gain clarity clarity uh, in his affairs of the religion. Because when you're seeking the knowledge, it, clar it should clarify things for you. When you're seeking knowledge, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is favoring you with that knowledge, with fiqh fiddin, then this is making things cl clearer for you. That you'll be able to read the books and you'll understand them uh, even better. Or you listen to the lectures and you will gain even more benefit because you our, uh, Allah is favoring you with knowledge. So seeking knowledge, it gives clarity. It gives clarity related to the religion. And it is also, it guides you to righteous deeds and piety. So seeking the knowledge, it brings clarity for you in your affairs. It gives you guidance. And it, 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 it encourages you to do good and righteousness because the more that you learn and, and gain and practice, and the more you know the text, it encourages you and it shows you the different ways in which you can worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how to do it properly. Also, this hadith shows us that by seeking the knowledge, <clears throat> that it implants light in your person's heart. That it makes your, your, height, your heart... <clears throat> it makes your heart uh, filled with light because the light is a source of guidance in order that you'll be able to distinguish between the truth and falsehood. That's incredibly, incredibly important is that you'll be able to distinguish between sunnah wa bid'ah, shirk wa kufr, you know, iman wa kufr, or uh, shirk, I'm sorry, shirk, and Tawheed. You'll be able to distinguish between these things when you have the light of knowledge. You know, you're able to distinguish the truth from the falsehood. You're also dis distinguished when there's fitna. When you have knowledge, you're able to, to, to distinguish where the truth lies. Because you have tools. Knowledge gives you the tools to be able to uh, distinguish uh, khair and distinguish the truth over falsehood. And also, uh, a last benefit that the 
Mashaykh mentioned with that particular hadith is that it also, that by gaining knowledge, it allows for you to know and understand the conditions or when a deed is correct or accepted or sahih and when it is facid, you know, when it is uh, not acceptable, you know, it, it's a deed that is, is not acceptable. Maybe it has shirk in it, maybe it, it, it's not in accordance with the sunnah. All of those things, you're able to do that with your toolbox, which is knowledge. Your knowledge allows for you to do that and gain that. And as we're, we're kind of running out of time, I just want to talk briefly about some of the obstacles to gaining knowledge. So we've already talked about the benefits of seeking knowledge. Let's talk about some of the obstacles. And this, these are some of the obstacles mentioned by Sheikh Al-Burjus, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, one of the mashayikh in Saudi, uh, who he, uh, he was in Riyadh and he passed away, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. He actually had an accident, a car accident, and I was in Saudi, uh, Saudi at the time, and I remember when hearing about it, and the sheikh had actually had a car accident. I think they hit camels at, in the in the evening. You know, it was a uh, you know traveling through the desert. Anyhow, the sheikh, rahimahullah taala, he mentioned several obstacles to seeking knowledge, and we mentioned the first one, and the first one being impure intentions. That when a person's intention for seeking the knowledge is uh, incorrect, then they, this is an obstacle for them attaining the knowledge that they're seeking. <clears throat> so for example, the person who wants to just show off. A person who is showing off, generally they're not going to strive to gain the knowledge that much. They're not going to be on the same level of the, as the one who's sincere, who's in the, in the books, you know, getting up early in the morning, and, and, and reading and studying, sitting with the sheikh or what have you. You, you. You'll see that in their action. So by having impure intentions, whether it be to show off, whether it be to, uh, you know, whatever the case may be, or, or, or for the dunya, maybe a person just wants to get a job. They want to get a job as an imam or they want to get a job in a... In, a, um, in an institute teaching Arabic language. There's nothing wrong with that. We're not saying there's anything wrong with that. But if that's their sole intention, meaning they did not, for them they looked at it as only a job, it wasn't to spread khair, and they weren't seeking the knowledge to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then their intention is not pure. And this will be an inhibitor for them to, I mean, a, a, something that prohibits them from uh, attaining knowledge. Another thing which prohibits people from attaining knowledge is a lack of practice. And as we mentioned, uh, Imam uh, Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala has the chapter entitled, titled uh, Al-Ilm Qabla Al-Quli Wal-Amal, you know, knowledge precedes uh, statements and actions. And this, uh, by practicing the knowledge, that helps you to uh, understand the knowledge as well. Because otherwise it would just be simply a matter of memorizing and, and so forth. But when you practice, it makes that knowledge become a reality. And you see the fruits of that, that knowledge. Abu Darda radiallahu anhu said, A person will not be an alim until he is a person who seeks knowledge. And you will not be an alim of that knowledge until you act upon it. So again... That's imperative, and it illustrates for us the importance of acting upon the knowledge that we attain. The third uh, obstacle the Sheikh mentioned, he said, relying extensively on books instead of scholars. This is incredibly important, because there are people who know the Arabic language, for example, and they just read books, but they don't at least listen to the lectures of the scholars that are, you know, now you can, you know, they're recorded on tape, they're on CD, they, you know, it's on Pal Talk, it's, it's everywhere, you, phone conferences, there's many different ways you can be in touch with the scholars of the Ummah. And so, uh, a person who relies strictly upon their books, this actually can be an obstacle. And 
this is also important for us that do not know Arabic, <clears throat> that, you know, we rely on translated material, and there's so much, there's a lot of beneficial material out there. But however, you want to be cautious about just uh, reading those materials, for example, books in fiqh or books in, in whatever you, you're, you're reading about, and then trying to make your own hukum from there, that you're trying to make your own ruling. No, you still need to go back to the people of knowledge. You still need to go back to the imam in your community or the local uh, student of knowledge or someone who, who has knowledge about those issues in order to clarify for you, especially before you make a ruling related to a specific issue or related to a specific individual or what have you, that you should be cautious of those things that relying solely on the books, even if it's the classical books, without the uh, guidance of the scholars can be dangerous. And the Salaf used to say, this is another statement of the Salaf that I remember one of the Mashaikh he used to always mention this, and he said what means that the person who makes, takes his books as his scholar, uh, as his scholar or scholars, then he is misguided. And why is this? This is because, again, you know, talaqi ilm ala ahlihi, that you have to take the knowledge from the people of knowledge. And even when a person knows Arabic, even if they know Arabic very well, okay, I'm not even saying just knowing some Arabic, I'm saying someone who knows the grammar and knows balagha and knows the different science, the nahu and knows the different sciences in the Arabic language very well. That even with that, when going back to the classical books, you need to take knowledge from the scholars who took their knowledge from scholars, who took their knowledge from scholars, who took their knowledge from scholars. Took their knowledge from scholars. There's a synod. There's a, a, um, a chain there of how, how we take the knowledge. And the reason is because a lot of terms you'll find that you may, you know, for us who can only go to the books and we have to look it up in an English Arabic dictionary or maybe even an Arabic Arabic dictionary, we still are not always uh, competent enough to know how did the classic, un, classical scholars, what did they mean by this term? You know, what did the classical scholars mean by the sunnah? Now, for example, I'll give you an example. That now we refer to the sunnah to mean, uh, a lot of time when someone says, did you make your sunnah? You know, they usually mean, did you make your, uh, your extra nawafil prayers, your extra uh, prayers, your, your, your maybe uh, four rakats before duhur or two rakats before fajr, before the fajr prayer and so forth that we refer to this as sunnah. But the classical scholars, when you go to the classical books in Akita especially, when they, uh, like books like Shara Sunnah by Imam Barbahari and Shara Sunnah by Imam uh, Baghawi and, 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 and the many, many uh, books in Akita and so forth, the classical scholars, when they say the explanation, Shara Sunnah, the explanation of the sunnah, the sunnah for them meant everything in the religion and it, it, it included creed it meant creed and it meant fiqh it meant the wajib and it meant the the so it meant the obligatory and it also meant the uh the extra uh, uh prayers and the extra deeds of of worship so the sunnah to the classical scholars it meant it encompassed the whole religion as imam barbahari says in his book shara sunnah he said uh a sunnah, a sun, I see, a Islam, al Islam huwa a sunnah, wa sunnah tu hi al Islam. He said that Islam is the sunnah, and that the sunnah is Islam. So this is how they understood that. And my point being here that when a person just reads books, they're not going to know and understand these issues, they're not going to understand many terms. And I recall a real example of a brother, he learned Arabic on his own, which is commendable, mashallah, may Allah preserve him and bless him. But when I found out some of the books that he was trying to teach the other brothers, he was trying to translate. He was translating from books like Majmu'a uh, Fatawa Ibn Taymiyyah. You know, this is a major, huge, huge book, the Fatawa of Ibn Taymiyyah. And so he was trying to translate from his very basic Arabic 
trying to understand what Sheikh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, you know, who had very precise um, um, ibarat, you know, very precise, um, you know, terms and, uh, and, and, and sentences in describing issues in the religion. Very intricate. Even you don't, even you have scholars that don't necessarily understand Sheikh al-Islam uh, Ibn Taymiyyah's uh, 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 speech, you know, in the depth that is needed and required. You know, the scholars have different levels. There's some scholars, they specialize and they've studied his books in, in detail and intricately, you know, and they've taken it from other scholars who were well aware of his books, you know, and, and knew his books and know the istilahat, they know the terms in which he, he used and, and what he meant in certain uh, sentences and certain, uh, you know, by certain terminologies. And my point being is it is imperative to seek knowledge from the people of knowledge and not uh, just rely on books. Another obstacle to seeking knowledge is that trying to uh, take knowledge from the major scholars or the elders. Be cautious of taking knowledge just from the youth because the youth, even the younger scholars, sometimes they're not like the elder scholars, especially when it comes to major issues. When it comes to major issues, we should refer back to the major scholars because they have the knowledge, they have the understanding, they have the experience, they have the wisdom, they have the composure in dealing with those issues. And I could give a lot of personal experiences that I witnessed in Saudi Arabia and Yemen to back this up, but our time is very limited. And I'll just mention a statement of Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu who said, Verily the people will not cease being in good as long as they take their knowledge from elder scholars, the trustworthy, and their scholars. And if they take it from the younger ones and the evil ones amongst them, then they will be destroyed. And this was uh, in Imam al al uh book. And this shows us again the importance of trying to, is knowing the scholars and knowing their different levels, knowing which scholars specialize in what, and what scholars that are well-rounded and on, you know, that are from the major scholars. This takes having knowledge and takes uh, sitting with students of knowledge and people who can direct us in those affairs. So we have to be cautious of just taking our knowledge from just anyone. You know, we can't just go to the local community and say, oh, so-and-so, he's a sheikh. I'm just going to ask him a question, this very intricate and detailed question, because you can be misguided. Now, maybe they are the only person that you have the ability and access to. So then, then you have to do what you have to do in that situation. But you just also should be aware that not all everyone's knowledge is the same. And the elders are not like the younger, the younger one, not like the youth. And the elder scholars and those major scholars that have the experience, scholars of the sunnah, I'm not talking about just any scholars as well, that they are on other levels compared to the... Um, the younger scholars and, of course, the scholars of the people of innovation and the people of desires. Another uh, obstacle to knowledge is that we should take knowledge in steps, that we should not busy ourselves with major issues over the minor issues. Okay? We should start with Tawheed and start in steps. You know, start by trying to learn something from the Quran and start by reading books in Aqidah, you know, in belief, in creed, because if you die memorizing the Qur'an only and you don't understand Tawheed, you don't understand monotheism, it's not going to benefit you. It's not going to benefit you. Why? Because you might die on shirk. So that's why Tawheed is the first thing you start with. Knowing uh, uh, the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Knowing uh, that He's the only one worthy of worship. And knowing that He has divine names and attributes and that we can make dua to Him by those divine names and attributes to come closer to him and have him answer our supplications. So starting with the basic issues before you get to the major issues. Don't start talking about the protest in Libya and the protest here and, and whether this government is, is uh, a Muslim or not Muslim. Have they apostated or have they not apostated? You're worried about issues like this and you don't even know the categories of Tawheed. Or you're worried about, um, you know, other, you know, major, major issues, and you don't know how to properly uh, clean yourself 
you know, whether water is pure, you know, rainwater. Can I make water from a creek or not? Someone urinated in this water, can I use it for wudu or not? You know, these are the basic issues that we need to, we need to begin with. We begin with the tawheed and the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we need to know those issues which will help us practice our obligatory issues, the obligatory duties that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has uh, legislated for us to do. For example, the salat. So we have to know tahara. We have to know the fiqh of salat. We have to know, and if you are a person who has wealth, you need to know the, the basic fiqh of zakat. You need to know those things which are an obligation upon you to practice. So taking knowledge in steps. So the person who takes knowledge in great leaps and bounds, this is actually an obstacle to gaining real knowledge. Also, arrogance and pride. And this also is a preventer, something that prevents us from gaining knowledge because knowledge requires humbleness and it requires good manners to really gain the thamarat al-ilm, to really gain the benefits of knowledge. It requires uh, that humility and we should be humble in, uh, in, in trying to and respectful to the people of knowledge, even if it's a student of knowledge, even if it's your local imam and they have knowledge, if it's, you know, whoever, uh, that, you know, the elders, we should be respectful to them. And we should not be arrogant and think we know better than them, you know. But rather we should be, uh, have our hearts open. So that way if we're corrected, maybe you'll be corrected by someone who has less knowledge than you. Maybe they're a new Muslim, but they've been reading more about this particular issue. You have to be humble and accept that, the fact of being corrected. Another obstacle to knowledge is the lack of sacrifice and the quickness to give fatwa, the Sheikh mentioned. So that, we, you know, knowledge requires uh, a sacrifice. You know, it requires juhud. You know, as the Arabs, they have a statement, they said, Man jadda wajid. You know, whoever uh, uh, strives, then they will attain what they are striving for. You know, so when you strive for something, you have strived, uh, you know, and, and I remember Sheikh Mukbal, rahmatullahi he used to say a, a, a statement, and also it's a statement from the Salaf, so you'll find it in the classical books, but that the person, he said, um, you know, uh, you know, that knowledge, it doesn't come by a comfortable body. The person who's seeking the knowledge is not, is generally, the person who's really, really seeking the knowledge is usually not, unfortunately, balanced in that sense. Because really seeking the knowledge, you know, the people, the, the scholars got to their position, not because they had time to do this, they also had time to do this, they had time to do this, no. They spent most of their time in order for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to raise them that, to that level. They had to spend their time with knowledge. And this reminds me of our Sheikh, Sheikh Suleiman al-Rahili, Hafizullah ta'ala, one of the, uh, the the scholars in Medina. And he, uh, you know, he suffers from, I, I don't know what his exact illness is, but it, it uh, you know, they attribute it also to the fact that when he was younger, why the other Saudi kids and stuff like that were playing football, he was busy just studying. Even as a youth, he, he, he spent all of his time in the books. And that's why now you see that although he's young in age, but you see that he is like a, you know, a mountain of knowledge. He's well no grounded, especially in fiqh and a soul of fiqh. You know, he is like a, a may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve him, you know, a, a mountain of uh, uh, and, and a wealth of knowledge that people can refer to. <coughs> also, another obstacle to seeking the knowledge is laziness. And <clears throat> I think that goes without saying, and we, we already mentioned before, and Ibn Abbas said, radiallahu anhu, there are two blessings which most people lose out on in regards uh, in, in regards to, and that is good health and free time. And, and that also is in conjunction with the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who mentioned the two um, blessings which most people uh, lose out on, and it is, of course, a siha wa firag. You know, it is, uh, you know, healthy, their health, you know, using your health to do righteous deeds, you know, seek the knowledge, do good, and be strong in your ibadah and your free time, you know, blowing your free time by wasting it, doing unfruitful things. And the last thing the Sheikh mentioned was procrastination and hoping, uh, hoping without struggling to attain the knowledge. That's also an obstacle to attaining knowledge. 
And I ask Allah the Almighty to accept this humble effort from us and bless us all with al nafi and rizqan tayba wa amalan mutaqabbilan wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam since it's time for the Isha prayer. And I will, I just want to recap very briefly about the... Uh,